Hello everyone, I'm Parthiv. Welcome to the series or podcast on the Insight Family Enterprises, the IFE podcast from Deloitte. In this podcast series, what we would be looking at is delving into the fascinating world of family enterprises. With a host of speakers through this series, we would be delving into family enterprises, the nuances around that. What are we going to talk about is with regards to succession, how these family enterprises uh, succeed from generation to generation. Uh, with this, let me delve into the first topic of today, which is going to be a global overview of family enterprises. In this, what we're going to do is catch up on a snippet on multiple aspects with regards to the family enterprises, both in India and globally. Talking next would be with regards to succession and the conundrums around that. And lastly, we'll be talking about the family offices, the fascinating world and the world that is changing. I get into the first series wherein I get welcome uh, both Adrian Batty and Shekhar from the Deloitte perspective. Uh, Adrian with an experience of more than three decades, helping out when working closely with multiple family offices over his spanning career. And with that, with, we also have Shekhar from an India perspective, who's our Asia Pacific as well as India leader from a family enterprise perspective. Family enterprises, as you all know, is one of the oldest form and the backbone of any economy, whether India or globally. It has been there for multiple generations put together. If we go back into history from the Bazaar Systems Day till today, family enterprises has been the economic backbone of any country. Let's get into the first question for Adrian and Shekhar. How do you fam perceive family businesses in today's time? Well, if I go first, Shekhar, uh, we at Deloitte Private love family businesses. Um, we know across the world they count for something like 70% of the world's GDP and it's a similar type of percentage in each local market. They provide a staggering amount of opportunity and they also employ something like 60% of the world's workers. Uh, in my time, you know, I've seen family businesses, they count for some of the, the largest and most well-known products, services and brands. They're very agile, they promote a sense of entrepreneurship, they invest in the long term, and whilst they aim to be profitable, they often have a higher purpose. And that purpose might be to simply provide for the family. It might be to, you know, produce a legacy into time, or it might even be to support the community in which they're, they're set up in. Indian family business has a rich family heritage and the culture. And if you look at it, more than 60 to 70 percent of the Indian family businesses, Indian businesses are dominated by the family enterprises. 50 percent of the stock exchange companies are family-owned enterprises and family businesses in India. I mean, more than 100 publicly traded family listed companies are listed in the stock exchange. So India has got a rich legacy and the growth of family enterprises. And Indian businesses and family enterprises has been a traditionally family-centric business with a high values, culture, ethos and systems. So therefore, there's one more important reason, Parthi, probably if you look at the analysis statistics, a lot of Indian family enterprises are going global and they have the ambitions to go global. And that's where the Deloitte comes into the picture and helps them and services them. Adrian, you made a very important point with regards to creation of legacy, being agile at the same point in time. What are your views on creation of a legacy to ensure that there is a multi-generational family enterprise which goes on from one century to, to another? I think to start with, you know, there's plenty of statistics that sort of highlight the demise of families who haven't made it from the first generation to the sixth, to the second or to the third or the fourth. But there are plenty, as you're highlighting here, that have made it through. So. Uh, and increasingly, we're getting better at actually understanding, well, what broke down those particular families? What issues did they have? And how can you actually address those before they become, you know, fatal to a, to a family business? There is something secret. There's a secret source in family enterprises. And as Shaker said before, when we look at family enterprises from a Deloitte point of view, we actually sort of bring into, into being the individuals themselves, the family yes. office, if they actually have one and the family businesses that they own or control. And I think that conglomerate of activity is what allows people to build a legacy. There is more people invested in seeing it, seeing it become successful. But from the families that I've really worked closely with, what I have observed is that they invest and they have a long-term outlook. 
they're very patient and they and they do make decisions that set themselves up to be successful in the longer term the other thing that is is quite quite common now and becoming more common across more families is more families understand this notion of stewardship where they understand that for a period of time yes they are the custodian of the family or the family business but it is their duty to sort of hand it off to someone else you know they, they're starting to better understand that for their time in leadership roles um, they, they've got a certain function and activity performed but it's it's their duty to actually make sure that when they step off they've left the organization in a better state than when they found it and i think if the learnings from these families that have managed to go through multiple generations. The learnings are that when you've got an environment where everyone understands that you are to hand off at the right time, then people are actually looking uh, at this particular organisation as something that runs into perpetuity rather than a, than a point in time. Shekhar, something from your side on creation of legacy? Sure. sure. What has become important in the present day is while you have a family values which leads to the family legacy but the changes in the business environment the changes in the economic landscape of the organization which is operating the family businesses wanted to expand their footprint beyond their normal areas of operation second Due to the technological changes and technology advancement, without compromising on the family legacy and the family values, the family businesses is seeking to expand its global footprint. Now, as Adrian correctly mentioned, which I mentioned earlier, a family business has got three components. One, the family, the entire family unit as a whole, one unit, then the organizations which this family unit runs and the family offices which manages the all so there are three components in the family businesses now the correct confluence of these three family units makes the family business more success and takes the legacy forward and that is what the focus of the present day indian family businesses are right now while carrying the legacy however with the new technology taking into the global footprint and that is how the legacy is undergoing a change path with that the next question to both of you all would be like how does one take undertake a succession what is the recipe and what are those quick tips you would leave for our audience from a succession planning perspective look across the across the globe we've worked with thousands of families now over a long period of time and what i do know for sure is that there's no succession that is the same from one family versus the other. There are some nuances involved in every single family. But what we have sort of developed is some methodologies over time. There's so many scenarios that we've come across and we've got this, a good feel for the cause and effect of how those particular scenarios play out. And so what we have learned that we've got this notion which we call our big five. If we can help families really work through the four or five key things that we find challenge families, then succession becomes a lot easier. And some of those big issues are around just basic stuff like communication and transparency. They're things like, you know, equality amongst the family members. They're, they're matters like um, some of the patriarchs or matriarchs not wanting to let go. There's issues there around the, the, the ability, competency, education and capabilities of the next generation. Are they ready to take over? What needs to be put in place for them to be ready? And then there's also the governance and structures. Um, so, you know, what we have found is that if you can get the families to understand what the speed bumps might be in the road ahead, there's every chance you can solve for them well in advance, which makes for a smooth transition. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Shekhar, something from an Indian context? Sure, Patti. The way I would like to put it is across is that the first, the family should recognize that they need a succession and the timing of the succession. First, right. there should be a conscious recognition of the fact 
in the family group yes they need to recognize the importance of succession in the family as well as the timing of the succession both are very important right and that should also be recognized that the family succession is different from a business succession a family succession does not lead automatically a business succession both are different parameters having concluded the timing of the family succession the need for the family succession the next important point is that you need to take all the family members with you take the family members together have a consensus amongst the family members on timing the need and methodology of the mode of doing the family succession it's very important now the families have grown the first generation family has gone to third or fourth generation family with more members the family governance is as important as a corporate governance for any business house or any business family therefore institutionalizing the family governance model is very important creating a family constitution council or the family governance council with representatives from each family or business house how they want to go about it also having some sort of an external advisor who can influence in the positive way this family members create the roles and responsibilities in a more transparent manner create the policies in a more transparent manner avoid the interlocking of the ownership of the family businesses make sure that each family business is run separately within the family governance and create a set of policy document which would help not only now which would also help future because the families should be united while the businesses can be divided amongst the family members or they can run as an independent unit but the families should be united to make sure that the business survive in the long run so therefore these are all the few tips that i would like to give it back moving on uh, to the next question is where what would you believe and uh, you know what's your observation on the uh, experience working with the family offices per se which is away from the operating entities and the family enterprises adrian well it's certainly something that we endorse um you know the the definition of a family office varies greatly i mean that can be um quite small or quite large and it and it varies depending how each family wants to set it up so there's no set formula on how uh, a family should organize themselves in that respect but what we are learning is that um families who um have as we've touched on a healthy family and a healthy business um you know tend to go quite strongly um what we've also found is that those that actually you know look after uh, what I call the golden goose you know protect the capital you know protect the thing that actually makes the most amount of money and look after that with you know very soft hands and everything else will work out in time we've also learned that in early days in my experience a lot of families probably had too much wealth tied up in one asset so this concept of a family office has been quite positive in the sense that you know some wealth has been you know diverted across to another bucket and in that bucket they've then been able to invest and diversify into other types of asset categories having this family office has also provided a, a, a greater breadth of things for the family to get involved in so sometimes you have families who wish to work in the business and sometimes you don't so if you've got a family office that actually has some capital to pull, to deploy then perhaps there's opportunities for other for other children to get involved in investments that family office actually makes i've also seen over time you know the fam- one of the core functions of the family office is around making sure that people have got timely accurate and and, and sort of informative reports Let, let's let's use that as a as a base to actually educate people as to well how did we perform why did that investment go well why didn't it go so well to help with the education process the, the last comment i'm making in terms of just these family offices is and it goes back to that that notion of creating some separation from the business is that I've seen it work really well where distribution policies are put in place where you know a an appropriate percentage of the business earnings moved across into a family office that family office then controls all activities um outside of the business including those that pertain to the family but we put in some rules around you know what sort of income should be distributed to family members 
We put some rules around who pays for what bills. We put some rules around, you know, the, the, the protection. You know, if, if things get tough and bank covenants become tight, then maybe we don't provide a distribution. And we also do it to provide some certainty because we found that too many people in a family unit, if they didn't have sort of clarity of what their income levels might be, then we've seen it at its worst actually sort of destroy the business because they all try and tear it down to access some capital or income. So, so for me, you know, the family offices have been a great way for families to set up outside of, you know, what was once a traditional business. Uh, what is your point of view from an Indian context in your experience of working with family offices? Okay. So traditionally, Indian family offices and Indian family promoters and family businesses were focusing on society through the charitable trust, which are created for doing a lot of what I would call the charitable activities in their choice of choose and choice of uh, choose and field. Similarly, the family businesses were also investing in through the holding company structures in certain assets. But off late, due to the growth of the unicorns and sunicorns and also the availability of talent, a lot of family promoter, a lot of promoters as well as the family offices would like to encourage that sort of a talent, protect that talent, and therefore Thanks to the boon of the unicorns and unicorns, the investment in the startups has become one of the attractive propositions for the family office. At the same time, thanks to the growth of the CSR initiatives in India, a lot of corporates, a lot of family-owned businesses, a lot of promoters are also leveraging the family offices to spread the CSR activities through a right vehicle. It can be a charitable organization, it can be a Section 8 company, but through some form of or the other. Now, the family office today is focusing on these two areas, investment in the startups, unicorns, unicorns, and investment in certain assets, plus carrying out a social activities. And therefore the family office, family office has got a twin responsibility. But what is important statistics is that some of the family offices are also looking to set up the family offices outside India for multiple reasons. But one of the important reasons is that they also look to find an asset outside India to make sure that they get the benefit, the organizations get the benefit. So that's what today the family offices are looking in India and outside India as an option for them. And particularly in the recent budget, as you know, Parthiv, the introduction of the concept of variable capital company, which is on the lines of Singapore and Mauritius, and also continuation of the gift city in India, gives much more avenues and the options for the family office to expand themselves. And therefore, the family office, what it was purely as an investment company, has expanded its horizon. And in my view, it will further expand its horizon in the areas of investment, plus social side and that is becoming very very clear part thank you shaker uh adrian coming back to you uh deloitte as you are aware has recently concluded a survey of single family offices uh would you like to share some global insights that uh is uh, emanating from this entire survey i would love to and firstly i'll say that family offices are very positive people so yes, we did interview about 354 of the largest families globally with a pretty equal spread across the, across the globe. And um, out of that particular report, and this is the first of our Insight series, which got released in May, and there's further reports coming out this year, further three reports. So look out for the next one, which should be due sort of middle August um, for Asia Pac. So be quite relevant for the Indian market as well. But out of that, um, I'd encourage the listeners too to this podcast to download the full report, which you can get by looking up the, the firm's website or, or otherwise the LinkedIn profile of Shaker or myself. But um, out of that survey, we sort of um, summarised into the feedback, summarised into 10 themes. First of those themes were that um, across the globe, family offices expected their, their, their accounts and the assets under management to grow some 70% expected a lift in the next little while. Number two, they all manage their risk very well, but we have noticed a shift in what they perceive to be the most important types of risks. You know, a few years back, it was around inflation. 
but now more so it's around geopolitical risk and the like so and a global recession um, to that end uh, number three was around private equity and you know it's become the largest class of assets in in the average portfolio build of these families you know for a long time it was actually um, equities, but now families are preferring to sort of do more direct investment, whether that's directly themselves or, or through these intermediaries, that's becoming quite prevalent. Um, so it's got up to about 30% of their portfolio. Uh, sustainability still remains quite high on everyone's agenda, although in some markets it's sort of cooled off in terms of priority. So still high, but everyone's taken a bit of a more considered step forward in terms of how they invest into that particular sector. Family offices we've noticed are further professionalising, so there's going to be a move to bring more capability in-house. They'll be picking off people from, you know, professions like our own, <laughs> accounting, legal, tax, investment banking, to try and add some more, some more sort of skills. You know, like they don't want to be the experts at everything, so they're looking to partner with more people to assist them deal with, deal with the complexity of the world that they live in. That might mean helping getting some transaction support or some tax advice or helping, you know, it might be legal, it could be any range of services that they, they choose to partner with rather than build internally. Family offices have for a long time invested heavily in tech, but they themselves perhaps have not invested heavily enough in their own tech. So um, they are making some moves to in further invest in their own technology platforms, which then rolls into the next theme, which is around cyber. You know, it was quite staggering that 43% of the families that we surveyed had a cyber attack in the last 12 months. 25% of them had a more than one cyber attack in the same time period. Mm. But what was even more staggering was that 31% of them don't have a plan to deal with cyber. So, you know, and 43% of them said that their plan that they have got could be a little bit better. So cyber is certainly becoming something top of mind. Succession, which we've touched on already in this, in this um, podcast is certainly something that's top of mind. I mean, there's an aging demographic of the patriarchs and matriarchs that are steering many of these families. And so it was quite alarming to us to sort of see that over the next 10 years, something like 41% of the families will change hands. But what was also alarming was 41% of those families don't have a plan on how that's going to actually materialise. And the last theme was around the next generation, you know, what came out was, you know, 70% of the families we spoke to had confidence that their plans for the next generation was solid. They've, they've got the right people, they've got the right people in the roles today, and that transition will be quite seamless. But that then leaves 30% that aren't confident that their plans are yet right. And so part of this has been that sometimes the next generation don't want to follow in the parents. So there's some big thinking to do there. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was really insightful. A summary, I would say, in a couple of minutes on the entire survey. Thank you, Adrian and Shekhar. It was a pleasure having both of you on this podcast series as we come to the close. A lot of things to uh, take away, for me especially, uh, to name them. Family Enterprises has been there, will always be there. It's just about how do you plan it, both from a succession perspective, whether it is handing over to the next generation, on the wealth side or whether it is succession in the business and lastly and the more important thing is how do you diversify and take those risks at the same point of time de-risking your family enterprises to ensure that it moves from one century to another through the use of family offices guys stay tuned for the next episode where we will be looking into some more of these aspects in a little more detail thank you Pati. Thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you